I'll, uh, I'll get started. So um, I'm Brad, and uh, this talks about what do you do when you've released a game and you, you want people to play it, but at the same time you need to balance it? How do you, how do you make sure that the changes that you're making are actually improving the game? Uh, how can you be confident about those changes? And how does it make you feel to be constantly told that your game's not good enough? So, um, hi. Um, so I think, so the, I, I do need to apologize because I had a bit of a slideshow meltdown, so we're missing some audio today, but look, we'll just, we'll just soldier on. Um, secondly, I need to apologize because I'm not actually qualified to give this talk at all. <laughs> what I mean by that is, so I've released games, um, and, but the biggest game I've released or the biggest game I worked on was canceled. So I, did, I never released anything that was big enough to need like this huge, big balancing effort. Um, and uh, so the, the, the one game that I worked on that, that kind of would have uh, was it was like an MMO scale thing. We did a lot of balancing, but uh, we didn't have to do anything post release. But that's exactly what I'm talking about today, right? So I'm not even, I'm not even qualified to talk about it. Oh man. So, okay, so why am I even allowed to be here? Um, so, so I'm fascinated with the idea of, of game balance and, and the process of, uh, of play um, and how games aren't just static things like a book, right, or a film. Uh, they change and people change. Um, I'm fascinated with um, stuff like the current state of Priest in Hearthstone um, is pretty bad. Like competitively, it's it's barely viable. You know, that's you know, someone brings a priest deck to a competitive event, and people are like, "Whoa, does he know something we don't?" Because priests just been getting worse and worse and worse. But the rumor was that Blizzard knew of a meta for priests that was amazing, and they pre-nerfed priest for those reasons. Um, and people haven't really been able to find that secret unicorn meta that would, would kind of make Priest viable again. But that idea of kind of pre-balancing something, right? So normally your meta uh, is defined by the players and, and your design lags, right? Because you're observing them. But this is a case where it was the other way around, ostensibly, right? So that's really interesting. This is, um, these are the tier lists, like the player power ranking lists, the character power ranking lists for Super Smash Brothers. And Super Smash Brothers was never patched. You know, it came out and it was out for like 12 years um, or nine years. And uh, it, so it didn't get any patches. But look at the amount of shift there is in which characters are considered good and which characters are considered bad, right? Like um, if you break it down a bit, um, to some of the characters that kind of rose over time. It took like um, over two years for people to kind of find any viability for Donkey Kong at all, right? They, they didn't really know how to play him for two years. Um, and characters like um, Ice Climbers went down for ages and then someone worked something out or something else changed, right? In this kind of fluid environment and it allowed people to start playing that again. I mean, there were characters that were kind of just always good, but there's also characters that were terrible and they rose up the list and it's actually because the pro players um, got sick of playing the characters they could just beat everyone with and so they started choosing the like decidedly shit characters because what's more humiliating than beating someone with the shittest character? Okay, so I talked to a bunch of people. This is how I solved the problem. I talked to a bunch of people that, that do know something about post-release balance. And the idea here is you might be thinking about releasing a game, you might be thinking about, maybe you're already in this kind of phase. What do you expect? Uh, how do you solve your problems? How do you prepare for the worst? Okay, so here's the breakdown. Um, and I guess I probably could have called my talk. Uh, I balanced my game using this one weird trick. It's not one weird trick. And it's also, <coughs> the stuff here is, is fairly general, but it doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, okay? so. I mean, I think you're smart enough to know that. Okay, so here's the first one. The first one is know your game. Okay, and it sounds pretty kind of obvious, um, but what does that really mean? It means, um, do, do you really know what the, what the core of your game is and what the core of your fun is? Um, and have you, 
Have you forgotten that somewhere along the way? Because it's going to be really important when you're making decisions about balance, like your game's identity, right? So it's such a dance of trade-offs, right? Game balancing. And you spend a lot of time trying to discern what's an issue and what isn't an issue, what should you fix, what shouldn't you fix. Um, and the best way to know which trade-offs are worth doing is zooming back out and looking at your core values, right? Like, what is my game meant to be about again? Does this thing make sense, yes or no, right? You, if you look at a game like um, Eve, it is, so I spoke to Brendan, uh, Brenton Hooper, who, who is actually a, um, an ex-Brisbaneite, well, I guess he's still a Brisbaneite, he just lives in Iceland. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, according to him, it's a game about interesting social interactions, right? I know it's like just a space-themed spreadsheet, but for him, it's, it's all about social interactions. And it's kind of hard to know where social interactions stop and PvP begins, right? Is one a subset of the other? Um, but in any case, social interactions, PvP, all this awesome stuff like combat, that's a social interaction, that's fine. Backstabbing and intrigue and all that kind of stuff, that's, that makes EVE really amazing. They've got market PvP, right? So warfare in the economy, right? People trying to like flood, a, flood the market with X or wreck someone's margin on Y, okay? And that, that's an interesting social interaction. So it's all kind of garnered and, and, and pushed by the game mechanics. So if the team is making a balance change to a bunch of weapons, um, well, Brenton explains it. What we're it. actually doing is trying to encourage more of a particular type of combat because it's more engaging as a group to do that. So the idea is that by, by changing uh, weapons and ships, it's not necessarily about weapons and ships, it's about how can we make combat more interesting, how can we make the, the social, quote unquote, social interaction, maybe it's anti-social interaction, more interesting. Okay, so that's the behavior that they're looking for because that's at the core of EVE. That's what they're going after. It's not pew pew, it's, it's like, I don't know, I don't know the other sound effect that it would be. And so that's fine. But there was this thing that you could do with drones. I don't know if anyone's an EVE player in the room, but you could, you could manufacture drones, right? And they were like attack drones or like you could command them to do things. But they put this thing in the game where you could assign your drones, you could manufacture like a, like a buttload of drones and then assign them to another person. And so if like 200 people got together and manufactured all their drones and then assigned them to one guy, and that made that person incredibly powerful. Like, he just, like, just wipe people off the field like this. So he's essentially just able to point, you know, at a, at a ship and a, and a gazillion drones attack it, right? And everyone that's is kind of just sitting around and they're just a factory for making drones for this guy. So you're looking at it and you're kind of like, well, that's kind of an interesting social interaction. But it's, it's kind of not, right? It's, it's, it's boring for a whole bunch of people. Um, you're just really auxiliary to the fight. You're not really taking part. Um, so that was a case where they looked at it and went, this is interesting, this is crazy, we didn't expect it, and it kind of makes us smile, but, and you're clever, guys, that's really clever, but this has to go. This isn't part of our core game, okay? We gotta, we gotta balance this out. And so they did, they, they changed how many drones you could assign. The other issue was with, they introduced a jump system, so you could kind of like, you know, like jump space, like, Te almost teleport to another area, which, which was like a convenience thing, because you know, it takes a while to travel through space. And it enabled people to cover huge distances relatively instantly, which is convenient, right? And convenience is good in games. So uh, World of Warcraft took out that, that whole kind of ammo system where you had to have quivers and you know, make sure you buy arrows when you're in town and all that kind of stuff. And it made the game more fun, you know? So, their core value there in doing that was um, to, to serve that idea of um, a world that you can explore, you don't have to think about kind of micromanaging your ammo. Uh, but this change, this kind of jump change, this convenience for, for jumping, soon became a problem because if two major factions were having friction, and you kind of have this situation where it's kind of a galaxy and it's just two factions fighting over it, right? Just one on one side, one on the other. So whenever they were having friction. And any time there's any massive fight, everyone would be there. So immediately, as soon as a fight springs up, bam, everyone on the server's just there, in the fight straight away. No one's lagging because they were, oh, I happen to be four systems away. They can just be there instantly. 
And it kind of wrecks the idea that space separates people in a massive space game, it kind of takes space out of it. So that was another one that had to go. It wasn't part of the core. Um, in Darkest Dungeon, players would complain about all sorts of things because the game was hard, and that's kind of normal. They can't min-max decisions because there's always downsides. Okay, it's, it's kind of like worse or, or worser. Yeah, you're conflicted. Wow, this is my best fighter, but he's an alcoholic zealot, you know? Right, so he's going to cause problems in town, but he's pretty handy with a blade. Okay, well, what do I do? I really need him in my party. I'm just going to have to live with the downsides. And they all had downsides, right? You couldn't optimize that. Um, and so you're co collecting feedback, and players are hating it. Some players are liking it. It's kind of conflicting, and you're like, do I... What do we do about this? And you need to look back to your core values. What is the right move for the game? And having a really strong creative direction, a really strong goal at the game is, yeah, it really is your waypoints. Um, and something interesting about Darkest Dungeon is if you look at the art style, it's so bold and strong. The design is so bold and strong. It's just, it's, it's got its core ideas, which is about making you conflicted, making the decisions are never easy. And then that makes, ironically, the decision easy to know whether to make a change to this, this game balance. Your internal team is really, really important as well. So knowing your game is also about the people on your team knowing your game, okay? And that does get a little bit hard when teams are really, really big. Okay, so the guys, um, the guys at uh, Blizzard that I spoke to, they did say that they've moved to a system where they're kind of using a more kind of uh, small team, multidisciplinary cell approach, but even then, um, does the guy over the other side of the room know about the issues with Warlock or, or Fury, Fury Warrior or whatever, right? So it's hard to have conversations with people you're sometimes speaking a different language. At an indie game company, you can potentially be across most of the issues, right? And that helps the team make decisions, um, inform decisions together. Oh, we've missed, see, we've missed a thing. Oh, that sucks. That's all right. So Tyler was essentially just saying that. He was saying, look, at, at Red Hook, all of us are across everything because the, the company's small and that lets us share the, the burden of the decisions. Second thing I want to talk about is um, perception is king, which probably seems obvious as well, but it's, it's kind of not as well. Because people play your game. Um, you expect them to care about uh, the mechanics that you put in there. Hey, right? dude, how you doing? So that's uh, Trent Custers from Armello. And one of the cool things about, I've got to say, one of the cool things about this was I contacted a bunch of people. Some of them I knew and some of them I didn't. And everyone was willing to help and just talk about game design. And that is something that I think is incredible about the game development community. Um, people just gave up their time. Um, Trent was eating lunch. Now, I'm going to apologize straight off the bat because I'm actually eating lunch while we're doing it. Right. So um, you might hear some chomping. Yeah. So I told him that I would just transcribe his chomping, right? <laughs> And he laughed in a charming way. So here's one of the things that Trent want, wanted to talk about was the fact that um, perception is king. OK, so there's a character in Amelo called Gore. He's often called out on the forums. And everyone's like, he's super OP, blah, blah, blah. OK, so people are complaining this character is really, really OP. Why are they doing that? And the team looks at the, the analytics that they do collect, right? So they do have some. Um, you know, computer collected analytics, and they see that actually the differences, like win rates and you know combat wins and all that kind of stuff, are actually only marginal. So why do players think that he's so overpowered? And they looked at, well, what what does this character have that other characters don't have? The problem was the perception of how good their character was was elevated, and the issue was that his ability which is only useful sometimes, is actually really powerful because it can affect people across the other side of the map, which no other character can do. So the problem is you get hit once or twice by that ability, which, which is kind of doesn't come up all that much, but seems so powerful when it happens, and it biases you to think, oh, that character is so OP. If you lose a match, you're thinking, I lost that match because of damn gore, right? Actually, he wasn't really that powerful, but the perception is that he was dominating you. Perception is fact. Right, so Trent's idea is that perception is fact. The numbers don't matter. The, the spreadsheets that are under the surface don't matter. The mechanics, well, they, they matter, right? But 
what matters more is people's perception of them. And if their perception is different to the actual design, then the player's perception wins. If you look at the picks for characters in World of Warcraft, like by, um, by race, people aren't necessarily, like it's not even, so there's some subjectivity going on there. And if you look, it's, it's human and blood elf and night elf, like all the human-ish races, right? There's a perception there that, you know, they kind of look like us, there's, there's a connection I have, they're beautiful, wh whatever it is, where people aren't really looking at the stat bonuses that you get. There's, there's been links to, oh, it's just, a, it's kind of a perception thing that these characters are gonna be good because I'm a human and they're kind of human-ish, right? I'm, I'm not playing as a cow or a panda. So Alex Brazy has worked at, on WoW for seven years and he says, at Blizzard, you need to have a keen sense for how perception influences behavior. So a lot of the game is based on feel and power. You hit something and big numbers come up and, and a lot of the, the branding on the forums is my numbers aren't big enough, et cetera, et cetera, right? Which is, again, it's a perception thing. Like, does my class feel powerful enough? Um, or it's about the perception of power. There was one time where we made changes to a character, didn't push them, but released it in the patch notes. Players completely adapted around the idea that that character had been nerfed, even though no, no balance change actually occurred, we just forgotten to put the balance file. So they nerfed a character, but they didn't actually upload it to the server. They just released patch notes saying that they did. Immediately people started complaining about that character. It's, it's too weak, it's, this is crap, you guys suck, right? You know, the, you know, you've probably commented like that before, you assholes, right? So, <laughs> I'm kidding. So, uh, just the perception that there has been a change, or oh, people like, how can you do this to, you know, to, to uh, priest, or how can you do this to my class, right? And, and they haven't, there's no actual change that's happened yet, but the perception is there, and that's enough. And it just shows that psychology, mentality, mm. and the open-mindedness of the player base is what defines the meta. And often you get a meta that, um, that is purely based on perception uh, rather than what's actually good, right? So those of you that are like Overwatch players in the room, there's people, you know, they're, they're picking characters that, that they think are good, but if, if you really look at uh, what, what the, the interplay of the competitive meta is, you know, you shouldn't be picking those characters. They're just, they're just gonna, you know, you're just gonna hold the team back. Or they're not suitable for that composition. Um, Brenton said the same thing in EVE Online. So he really believes in, so he, he, was, he actually coined the phrase, well, not coined it, but right, so I've taken the phrase perception is king from him. Um, and, he's, and he's really about perception is the reality for players. Doesn't matter what you see, right? It's, it's what they perceive. The data analytics at EVE, as you can imagine, are pretty impressive. They've got um, basically stuff running a whole Hadoop cluster that, that pulls data and is queryable over time, and then they've got a whole bunch of real-time stats as well that they can look at like at the second and just look stuff up because you know it's this kind of huge online thing. So they can get da data analytics on pretty much anything. He said the hooks for doing that have been in the engine since for the last 13 years. Even when they objectively measure their world, it doesn't mean that players see it that way. So they, relying on data analytics can actually give you a skewed view of how things actually are. You really need to be talking to players as well. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna get onto that. The data is important and gives some idea on what people are actually doing, but player perception is king. Like how people perceive something to be is much more important than how it actually is. And it's really interesting for you know, a programmer or a designer or, or someone that, that has a basis in, you know, maths and, and code and, and that kind of thing to be saying, well, that stuff is secondary to, you know, something that's kind of subjective. I mean, you, you would hope that it wasn't, but, but it is, okay. Um, do you remember his drone problem that we talked about, right? Um, so that needed to be nerfed because it didn't fit the design the core pillars that we talked about. We're going to stop it so you can only put like 10 people's worth of drones on a single person. Okay, so you, instead of assigning all your drones, you can just put 10, 10 drones. Okay, fine. So they announced it in the patch notes and... And they just kind of forgot to implement it? Right, so they did the same thing. 
that World of Warcraft did. They forgot to implement it. The thing about the, uh, the EVE guys is like, I don't know, they're sitting there refreshing the forums all day or something because they immediately reacted. Um, the entire meta of the game shifted and Garrett went towards something else. So before the patch even hit, they announced something and the whole meta of the game changes. This action, this drone thing was super popular. It suddenly became no one did it, just based on patch notes. And the patch hadn't hit yet. Everybody even knew that the patch hadn't hit, but people were like, I don't know, getting into the habit of not using drones anymore? I don't know. They actually left this unpatched accidentally, right, for like six months until, you know, some guys went, hey, you can still do this. And they're like, oh, shit. So again, players just reacted to the announcement of a change and acted as if it was reality. The next thing is knowing your players, okay? So that was about knowing your game. This is about knowing your players. And we were just talking about data analytics, right? So it's kind of like voyeurism, right? You're kind of like remotely checking out what other people are doing. And there's no harm in collecting analytics about your game if, if you can. Um, but is it actually helping you know your players? And is it actually helping you make decisions? Um, In Darkest Dungeon, you get really emotional responses. I was in this battle and this happened, therefore this character is just totally OP. Okay, that's a really common um, for type of forum post. I was using this character, this happened, and this needs to be buffed, this needs to be nerfed. Come on, hurry up, I'm, I'm gonna ask for a refund, right? Okay, so it's really good in that situation to be able to go, okay, kind of like what Armello did, like, let's check the data and see if this kind of bears to be true. And one good thing about data is that it lets strip you... Strip away all the emotion and feeling from... Okay, so it lets you strip away all the emotion and the feeling from the forums, which are normally overflowing with, with feeling, which is not a bad thing, by the way. Like, if players, even if they're angry, like dickholes, they, they're doing it because they love your game. The amount of people that I spoke to that were like, yeah, it's, it really sucks when someone jumps on the forum and calls us all sorts of nasty names and tells us how horrible we are, and then we actually check his stats and he's got like 700 hours in the game. Right, he, no, he loves it. He's just pissed off today. The problem is with data analytics is it's very passive, right? It's just kind of something you query. You don't really interact with it, okay? So it can't do everything. Um, but they're definitely not gonna solve everything. And if you don't know how to use it, you just collect all the data and kind of like sit there with like, I don't know, 50 monitors around you watching all the graphs. Um, that doesn't really help you, okay? You know, you can end up with tons and tons of data and really no plan for what to do with it. Right. Okay, so you need to have a plan for what you're going to do with your analytics data. And that helps you plan um, what you're going to collect and, and, and how you're going to use that. Um, for bigger games like Even Wow, that kind of automation is awesome. They both had automated systems that would email reports to the designers each day, okay? So <clears throat> uh, at Blizzard, they had something called um, Roar, which was like a, uh, it's like a rotation manager. To, to, it's basically which keys you're pressing on the keyboard um, to fire off particular abilities in whatever order, just, just to kind of make sure that that works and does the right amounts of damage. Uh, and the second thing they had was um, bots that would run overnight. So they'd load all the balance changes onto a bot. The bot would run overnight, go into a zone and like smash everything up. And then a report would come out the next morning, you know, showing the DPS and, and how much it needed to heal and all that kind of stuff. And it would do that again the next night and the next night on a, on a kind of uh, repeatable basis. And then you're looking for changes, right? Oh, one day the graphs are down. Oh, crap, what did we change? Like, <laughs> we better fix it. And this is great. It meant that every time there was a, um, a balance change, you would see exactly the impact. Okay, so you could see the impact of balance changes without, without players, right? The players are very important, but the more you can kind of do before you give it to players, the better. And, but that does take a lot of setup, like years of setup, okay? And it's the same with Eve. They... Um, needed to define what success was, what does a healthy economy look like, what does a healthy sovereignty map look like, uh, and then they had to set up all their dashboards, and that's all development effort. Potentially, smaller studios can't afford that. See the state of the economy, and there's like an economy dashboard that I can go on with that and show the whole bunch of data that I can then drill into. So one thing that Brenton said was that when he first got there, he set up a whole bunch of analytics and and um, it wasn't actually useful because he wasn't asking any specific questions of it. He was just kind of looking at data. 
So player feedback is now probably the, the really real crux of what we need to talk about. So this is all part of Novi Player, okay? And it's, it's much more interactive, but it's tricky because players are subjective, like really, really subjective. And sometimes it's a non-issue, like the thing they complain about, you don't need to fix it. People re will report on an experience that they believe should be fixed, and then it's actually just validating the design. Right, so if someone says, oh, I die a lot in Darkest Dungeon, well, duh, right? It's, that's fine. Um, people would complain that you couldn't heal fast enough. Like, uh, my healers can't keep pace with the damage that my, my card is sustaining. You know, it's impossible for me to heal enough to keep pace with the rate in which damage is done throughout the dungeon. And, and that was kind of part of the design, right? The way that Tyler explains the design of Darkest Dungeon is it's a war of attrition. Things are just slowly getting worse. Okay, and, and so for players to come back and say that actually that wasn't something he needed to fix, it was something he needed to, you know, like have a beer because people, you know, it was working. You shouldn't be able to tread water always by just sort of being in combat and always healing yourself back up. So his core pillars were basically coming back in the, in the feedback to him, and that's a good sign. Um, people can get quite vocal about random number generators and, you know, oh, now I lost to this, this is ridiculous. And it's so subjective, right? So. Um, I had a friend in high school who was really, really smart at maths. And um, years later, when I was doing my comp sci degree at uni, he came up to me and said, I'm going to the casino. Can you write me like a simulator that for every, um, I think it was two up, like for every throw of the two up, I want you to tell me what the odds are that it's going to come up like with something based on all the previous throws. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, the current throw doesn't depend on all the previous throws. If, if heads, heads has come up six times in a row, it's equally likely to come up a seventh time. Like, you're just subjectively being, you know, you've, you've kind of got this idea that the universe has to even itself out. That's not the way it works, dude. He was a really smart guy. I don't know what happened to him. Oh, I don't know what happened to this either. But what Tyler is saying is that you mainly think about like losing to, to random number generation, not winning to it. So you get shitty at the random number generator when it causes your death, but when it like helped you like, he's really jiggling. Um, when it helped you kind of get over the line, you probably didn't notice it because you're so busy like thinking I got over the line. Because yeah. you don't think about it when you're winning, but then you think about it when you lose. What he said. Okay, so a lot of this has to do with the education of your player community. Um, do they understand the core game? Do they understand the perception number split? That's going to be the quality of the feedback you're going to get. And Eve is a good example of this. Like I said before, guys refreshing the forums, guys that like spreadsheeting out all the data, they, they kind of get it, right? So there were times when they would give feedback to Brenton and he'd be like, oh, that's, that's actually the thing we need to do. So I wish we would just go, oh, yeah, that is the right thing. We just got to implement that. Right, so, and he would say that on the forums, like, we've taken your suggestions on board, we're just gonna implement that. that. Thank you very much, right? How cool is it to be, to kind of feel like you're part of the development team? A lot of this has to do with a core group that you can trust, and almost everyone that I talked to had like a beta channel or had like a core group of alpha testers that they would send stuff to first. Um, uh, and, it meant that they, they could kind of run something, like sanity check something with some trusted guys before it went to the public. You made allies within the top level players to your quest. Okay, so the Blizzard would make allies with the top level players and, and then feed them like secret builds. Some trust comes through pay, player skill, like getting the best people that are the, the best at the game. And so the WoW raid QA team that basically just run the raid content all day uh, they have... It has 10 pro-level raiders on it who are recruited from the community to work at Blizzard. So they just recruit people from, from the community and they bring them in to work at Blizzard. Actually, um, there's something at uh, EVE called uh, the, the Stellar Council, something like that. And it's actually they're elected by the player base as kind of representatives to interface with the design team, which is very organised. Okay, and they fly them out to Iceland two times a year and they have meetings with them. And they really include their, uh, their player base uh, in, in what they're doing. That doesn't mean everyone can do that. This is obviously a very big company, but it just shows the value of that inclusion. Um, and sometimes it's about giving certain players privileges within your community, like making them forum moderators or 
like I said before, f feeding them secret info. So um, Rami from Vlambia, when I, when I talked to him, said he did a similar thing. So the positive, he wanted to encourage a positive um, community. So the really positive people, he would just feed them information about the game. And then those positive people would rise within the community and make other people positive. And it was a really good way of kind of starting to do that. They did have to stop because it started to breed resentment and all sorts of horrible human stuff. But it was a good way to get things started. Something that is very important that Rami did say, though, was that, um, and, and this is a problem, I don't have his audio, that's my, my, my meltdown, um, was that it's really important to understand that your core group of players, if you're listening to their feedback all the time, they're probably really good at your game, which means you might be neglecting this, the beginning players. And so throughout Nuclear Thrones development, I mean, as you know, like it was early access and they like openly developed on a weekly cycle for like 90 weeks or something like that. Um, and they were listening to the, like, this core feedback all the time and the feedback was like, do this, ramp this up, whatever. And then the Vlambeer guys did not at all think, oh, these, like, we'll be losing touch with new players. They just thought, yeah, let's do it. These are the guys that are into the game. Let's do what they say. And, well, not do what they say, but let's like, take our cues from them. Uh, and then they were basically just making the game harder over the course of two years. And it wasn't until they went to a PAX and... Um, and they watched people playing, people couldn't even beat the first level, and they were like, whoa. And then they'd invite someone over from the core community and they would just speed run it. And they're like, something's wrong here. Like, it shouldn't be that bad. 1-1, one, one, you should be able to like, get past 1-1. One, one. You know, that, that shouldn't be the level that turns you away. So you need to be aware, like, listening to your core community is great, but they're probably really good at your game. Don't exclude uh, other people's voices. Find the ones that give good, well thought out feedback, reward them with advanced knowledge and ask them for feedback on I'm your ideas. I'm gonna contact like 12 or 15 people and I'm actually gonna just show them the entire rework but when it's literally nothing more than a piece of paper and trust them not to leak it. So that's quite amazing that someone from, from Blizzard would um, talk to people about designs that were in kind of in flux and trust them not to leak those designs. Good community management is, um, is something that you absolutely need. Um, and it's all about player expectation. You obviously have to be really careful about how you post and what words you use. Sometimes they have a policy where developers kind of don't post. Sometimes they have a policy where, yeah, you can, you can be a developer and come in and post, but, you, but community managers will do most of the work. You just have to be incredibly careful and try and make sure we cover all of the possible interpretations of the sentences. So people can misconstrue what you say. So you've got to think about the interpretations of, of how you spell things out. Um, good community management encourages discussion and helps players feel heard, and that is really, really important. When players don't feel heard, that's when they're going to start whinging on your forums, and that's when people are going to start leaving. First of all, you, you get more information. Second of all, they feel more heard. And you need to really set expectation about what you can and can't do feature-wise before it gets out of control, because people can get quite excited about something that's that's you know, jiggling around on the forums and it can spread like wildfire. And then the devs really need to come in and say, we can't actually do this. And it's not even because it's a bad idea or anything. It's just, we have to make choices all the time of kind of how to use our resources and. Rami said a similar thing. Like just because you as a dev acknowledge people's ideas doesn't mean that it's a, um, it's a promise that you'll implement them. So you kind of have to make that really, really clear. Managing flames, there's a lot of ways to kind of manage those, those people that are just being absolute assholes. Um, players do need to feel heard even when they're being jerks on the forums and you catch more flies with honey. So this is Alex from uh, World of Warcraft. He did work for um, League of Legends for a while as well. And um, he handled it this way. I acted out of the deepest amount of empathy I could. Okay, so he started with absolute em empathy and he wanted to validate so he made sure that... Acknowledge the emotion. So he, he wouldn't say, you're wrong to feel this way. He, it would always be, you know, that's okay. Like the way you're feeling is, is that's justified and fine. And then he would... Connect on the points you agree with. So find something about it that you can agree with and then start from there. Start your discussion from there. Because you're not, you're not going to solve the problem by just smashing them down. You've got to find some way to get on their level and then hopefully... Get them on your side, right? So now you want to work out what the real problem is. Now that you've kind of connected, you want to work out what the real problem is. 
then you seek understanding. You just repeatedly ask for clarification till the thread chills out. So if you can imagine a, like a flaming thread, the developer comes on, starts a conversation with someone and they're not hostile, they're just trying to understand and they're like, yeah, what, you, what you're saying sounds reasonable. Let's talk about like the nuts and bolts. And they keep clarifying and clarifying and clarifying. That, that thread is gonna chill right out. People are gonna stop whinging and they're just gonna go, hey, actually we're being listened to here. And if some new dickhole comes onto the forum and starts, tries to start something, people will be like, no, 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 don't, don't, do they're actually listening, right? And, and this is the experience that they, these guys have had. So things will start to calm down. When the thread's chilled out, all of a sudden you have allies in the thread. So you've got all these allies on the thread and you've actually got some help now. You've solved the problem because the community is managing themselves. Okay, so people are actually on your side, they're a positive community. This is the type of thing that Rami was trying to, uh, to foster with Nuclear Throne as well. Sometimes you do need to use your authority though um, and you just need to come in and, and, and bust people up. Um, oh man, all my audio is not working. So uh, on Armello, the idea was for people like Trent to let the community manager handle like 90% and only when absolutely needed would he come and post on the forum. It's a bit like, like when Jeff Kaplan or someone from Blizzard comes and posts on the forum. It's like the voice of God, right? And people just, they stop because it's, it's such an authority. And sometimes you need to do that. So, and some, a way of maintaining authority is maybe not get too friendly on the forums Maybe save your authority for when you need to come in and say, hey guys, this is the way it is. Um, we need to stop talking about this now. We need to move on, bam, and it's shut down, okay? When things get out of control. Also, the idea of actually giving people props and respect, okay? If they find an exploit or something, you're like, wow, you worked really hard on that. That was amazing. Um, and, and one of the things that they did on, on Armello was someone found out that there was a way to use the hoodwinked card, which unequips all your items to if you equip all your items, use the hoodwink card and then equip them all again, you get the equip bonus twice, right? And so it just doubled all your bonuses and, 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 and no one had ever thought of doing that before. The dev team didn't think of doing it. As soon as they saw it, they went, they jumped on the forums and they said to the guy, that is so cool, you just blew our minds. That, that's what an amazing idea. And they left it in the game because that's the way it's supposed to work. So they didn't deem it to be a game breaking thing. You need to let players be the heroes sometimes, uh, as in when they suggest solutions to you. Here's the power, the power of ego. Give people a bit of ego and they will do, start doing things for you. I know it sounds manipulative, but it's a way, like you don't need to be the hero every time. If you solve the problem, you're a, you're a game designer working on an awesome game, you, your ego is fine. But let your players actually share in that development process. Okay, you implemented something similar to what they suggested, but let them know that they helped, even if they were only just in the ballpark. Maybe they're totally wrong and you know we've already solved the problem. It doesn't matter. Let them take the credit for finding the solution. It doesn't hurt your ego, but it builds so much excitement in the community. Next release comes out, push it. The guy will be like, holy shit, my idea was the one that worked. Yeah, Wait, let, let him have the win. Oh, okay, so that's the hoodwink Give stuff. Props. We all, like that guy in the forums, we just jumped in, like three of us, like into the forums being like, oh my God, it just blew our minds. So the next thing I want to talk about is this, is actually, this is a really sucky part of, of what I spoke to people about. Um, and actually, I really hope my audio does work. And if it doesn't, I'm, I'm going to make it work. Absolutely. It totally gets to people. Okay, so this is, I'm asking each developer, does it get to you when people shit on you in the forums? This is what they're saying. Gosh, it's, that part just sucks. Fuck, man. <laughs> <sighs> that one could be really tough. We've been called League of Thieves. People have told me the cancer of the games industry. The cancer of the games industry. Like, it has a, it has a serious emotional toll on the, on the guys working on this. Look, I, I think that's the hardest part of uh, this job. It's pretty terrifying, you know, sometimes. It's a very real thing, and I would love to see it get better, not worse. So if anyone thinks that like posting stuff and like horrible, nasty shit on forums doesn't affect people, it does, it absolutely does. When you are making something vulnerable and you're putting it out there and you're constantly being told it's not good enough. One of the sentences that was said to me is, this limits the time you can stay in the industry, right? The thing is though, people learn to deal with it as well. It's a very real thing and I would love to see it get better, not worse. 
At a certain point, you know, you need to laugh off the stress. You support each other through the um, the tough time. And so we just we just try and support each other. You are you, are you in an echo chamber? I think to, the one thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to gain perspective. At? I think I played two at once there. Hey, just because you don't like something doesn't mean that other people aren't there, aren't engaging with it, having fun. Right. So there is a point where you need to gain some, some perspective and realize that the people that are telling you that they hate this stuff are like 0 0.05 of your player base and the rest of the people are fine with it or like it or love it. And it's okay to say to people, hey, if this isn't for you, then it's not for you, but everyone else is having a good time, so chill out. Don't knee jerk when you're making changes. Like, again, for those of you that have, have, um, have been playing Overwatch, you know, you've seen characters like buffed and nerfed and buffed and nerfed, and it's, just, it's crazy, right? So, I mean, I'm not saying they're doing a bad job, but it does seem pretty knee jerky. Um, when you're making changes, one of the best things to do is actually step back and just let things solve themselves sometimes. One technique is to double and halve, right? So if you need to change something, double it until people um, notice, if they're uh, not noticing, halve it, okay? Um, that's, that's, that's too much magnitude-wise for a WoW game, but the rule applies. So at WoW, it's, that's too much to do? Everything is so interlocked with each other that, that just shifting one little thing a little bit is going to have not an effect across the entire system. So at EVE, the systems are, are, are not isolated from one another, okay? So it's really, really hard to change something and not change 10 other things. But the, the CSM and the public play feedback process is incredibly important to the balance. So the way they deal with that is with that, that uh, council of stellar management, those elected players, right? When they make those changes, they pass it on to them and they kind of let them work out whether there were balance flow issues, okay? Small incremental changes that because of player perception that none of them were perceived as an actual, like a, a big enough nerf for the problem. So sometimes when you make small changes, right? So you try not to do this doubling halving thing, but you make small changes, because of player perception, people don't even notice the change. You know, we don't want to have to balance for the fact that someone might bring 75 holy waters or something. So this is an idea that Tyler has about if you've played Darkest Dungeon, you kind of do a dungeon, you come out, and any excess resources you had, like food or holy water or whatever, is gone. You just got to rebuy provisions the next time. And the idea of that is you're isolating each mission from the next mission. You, I mean, it kind of sucks that you lose your stuff at the end, but it means you don't have to balance the next mission for what if they came into this mission with like 300 food? Oh man, you don't have to think about that anymore. So sometimes siloing your systems is the right thing to do. Sometimes you also need to watch your players and things like Twitch and YouTube are probably the most uh, valuable resource you have for this. Um, a lot of game developers have like a, like a Twitch search that just searches like an automatic Twitch search and just notifies them when people are playing their game. Um, which is a pretty smart thing to be doing. People playing the game for the first time, see how they struggle. Okay, so this is Alex talking about what I was saying before about don't forget the people that play for the first time um, as opposed to your core community. So that what they would do at Riot would be that they would have like a, a, re a wall of replays and they would be showing games from people that were really new to the game. Like they called it, I think they called it Noob Tube. Uh, and then they had uh, it's like pro players. And you, you've kind of got the screens side by side and you can see the difference. You can completely see. Then you'd see players who are at the highest echelon of the game get to see the disparity, constantly reminded about the people you're trying to appeal to. This speaks to what Rami said about watching people not being able to complete the first level at PAX and realizing, hey, we've made a balancing mistake here. We've been listening only to our core community. The last thing I want to mention is that balance is a myth. And that kind of, kind of sucks because we've been talking about it all day. But what it really means um, is that no game is really balanced. Like that is not a stable state that games come to. I mean, look at uh, Smash Brothers, right? It didn't get a patch for 12 years and yet the player tier lists were all over the place, right? For, so for something quote unquote static, people were players, humans were finding an awful lot of dynamic, dynamicism in that. The whole concept of a game being balanced is a myth. Right, so that's, that's Trent from Armello talking about, look, don't, don't freak out going, my game's not perfectly balanced. It's okay. It's all right for it to be a little off or a lot off. That's actually what makes games beautiful. We wouldn't watch a game of soccer if it was two ro robot teams 
playing it. Actually, I would watch that. That would be pretty awesome. But, but you know what I mean, right? What makes it interesting is the asymmetry, right? It is the difference in skill or the difference in equipment or the difference in whatever, wind conditions, all that stuff. That's what makes games interesting. So perfectly balanced games make all your choices less meaningful. This whole conversation of balance on the internet and like this character's OP or this game isn't balanced. It's like, yeah, no game ever in its fucking, in, in the entire existence of video games has ever been balanced. And that's why <coughs> if, um, if you're in a really crappy situation in a game like Nuclear Throne, for example, and you, and you just, you need a weapon, any weapon will do, I don't care what it is, um, and you pick up like, I don't know, a shovel, um, and you're kind of like, oh, anything but the shovel, it would have been good. Imagine if shovel was perfectly balanced so that it was the same as every other weapon in the game. You pick up shovel, you're like, eh, whatever, right? It didn't really give you an emotional response to pick up a shovel because, eh, it's fine. I know a way to use that so that it's the same as everything else. But picking up a shovel, you're kind of like, ah, oh, this is going to make things really hard. That's good. That's what you want. It's not balanced. That's okay. Come on, PowerPoint. You can do it. This whole... We said that. Okay, so players will do crazy things, and that's okay as well. Uh, I want to tell you a story about EVE Online. You have this thing like player housing, right? It's kind of like Minecraft, you make your own house. In uh, EVE, they're called POS, okay? Your player-owned structures. And what they had in there was they didn't want people to be, just be able to smash like your houses down once you've built them. So they made this kind of force field around the house. And I'm just calling it a house, right? It's like a space station. It's much cooler. Um, they have a force field around it, and only people on the access list are allowed in. So it's kind of like a list of people that come into your nightclub, right? You're on the list, you're on the list, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you have a bunch of people in there. The thing is, um, if someone was inside, oh, if someone was inside the system, like inside the, 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 uh, the force field, and you revoked their access list, the game physics engine goes like, you shouldn't be there, and like bounces you out, and then you pull on the other part. So, if you're inside the POS force field, and I revoke you as my friend, you just get ejected, like into space, at a million miles an hour. And that was just kind of like, ah, we need to get people out of here. That's just the way the, way the developers implemented it. They released it, yeah, fine, whatever. What they found was, uh, when, when like, teams of people would come to gank people and, and, and smash them up, people would take refuge in their force fields because you couldn't get through them. They'd, they'd kind of crowd their whole faction into the POS and then the guy that owned it would say, everyone get into your biggest chip and then he'd revoke all their access at once and they would just all shoot out of this POS and they'd smash into their enemies and wreck them or they'd fly straight through and it'd be okay. Occasionally, you know, it's not like dust and crops, right? They'd, they'd smash into an asteroid and die. But most of the time they'd get away due to this kind of bug and the other, EVE Online guys were like, that's awesome, and they kept it in the game, right? They, they didn't ditch it because it was inventive, it was an interesting social interaction, it didn't mess with the, the whole like, idea of space, and they're cool with it. Okay, so that comes back to that idea of core values. P players doing crazy things is fine. In Darkest Dungeon, the Man at Arms class had some real problems when it first came out. It could do two things, right? It could guard another character, uh, and it could um, repost, like, a, like when someone like, tries to strike you, you dodge and you repost, right? Um, that caused some problems that were unforeseen, okay? I mean, they totally broke the game, like, and there was cases of like, you know, man-at-arms guarding other man-at-arms. Right, so you had these kind of like inception man-at-arms that no one could touch. Um, you had occasions where the repost wasn't like, there was no cooldown on it. It would just, every attack that was happening it would just repost, right? It was just unlimited. So you could just kind of send your man-at-arms into a heavy fight and he would just be like flailing around, wrecking everything. Demolish like bosses. Right. So they obviously, they had to nerf that. Um, they only picked that up because they saw it on Twitch. It wouldn't have been something that they picked up in their own code or through their own testing because they would never have done it. They would never have made a whole team of man-at-arms. So weird things can be okay. And just because there's broken things in your game doesn't mean you have to fix them. So this is Trent on Armello. But like, I could list off 50 to 100 things right now that might be broken in the game or might be unfair or unbalanced or whatever. Okay, so that's a game that's out and he's just fully saying there's a whole bunch of broken shit. He knows, like 100% knows it's broken. But it's okay. Are players worse off because of it right now? They're not like 
leaving the game, they don't hate it on the forums, it's not an issue. Put it on the back burner. Don't break your back over uh, trying to make your game perfect. That hoodwinked bug ended up being really awesome in the end. You know, you have that discussion, you're like, oh, is that cool? And we're like, well, yeah, that's how it works. So if someone, so a weird thing comes up, you have a discussion in your design team. Hopefully your design team is, like I said, if you've got a nice small compact team, they're across lots of the, the parts of your game. And uh, you can decide, is this, is this okay? Maybe it is, maybe like the Eve guys, you know, it's okay for the, the POS bug to, to launch everybody into space. So here's the takeaways. Perception is king. It doesn't matter what your spreadsheet says, it matters what people think, okay? Know your game because knowing the core values of your game means that you're going to know how to make those decisions. Uh, and part of that is, is getting data through analytics and, and whatever. And if you are doing that, make sure you're asking questions. You're not just gathering data for the sake of gathering data. Know your players. Actually be part of the community, um, whether that's through a community manager or whether that's just through um, your own kind of um, monitoring of, of what people are doing, watching people on Twitch, that kind of voyeurism, it's okay, it's fine. Uh, because that's the way you're going you're gonna to know. It's, it's as good as over the shoulder watching people play your game. Um, community management is so important. The amount of people I spoke to that said, we were a really small indie team. I wish we had have done community management earlier. We tried to handle it ourselves and it took too long. It, it, it ate up all my time or I didn't do it properly or whatever, okay? The hate is real. This one, I, I do actually just want to make sure you take seriously because everyone I spoke to was bummed out. Like when, I, when we talked about this, I could tell they were just like, oh man, you just reminded me of like why I don't want to come to work today, you know? Um, and I, I actually do think if there's one thing that's come out of this is I'd like to see, and I'd maybe like to be part of an initiative in the industry for us to be able to talk about these times when we're bummed out about our games. Um, I don't know how we'd do, we'd do that, but it's got me starting to think. Don't knee jerk. Um, when I asked Rami for some advice and I said, what, what advice would you give to people that are looking to do this kind of game balancing dance? He said, dance slow. You know, it's not a race. You don't have to fix that thing right now. Sometimes if you just stand back and you, you know something's a problem, instead of just trying to fight the fires, let the players work it out. They're, they'll often just adapt. They'll often just find a, a workaround for it and you won't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and balance is a myth. The idea that it's going to be perfectly balanced and you're, you're going to get there one day and then you can go on holiday. It, I mean, okay, that sounds depressing, but... Um, I guess the idea that you don't have to make your game personally perfectly balanced. It can be asymmetrical, it can be um, a little bit imperfect, and that's what gives games character, that's what makes games competitive. Some of the lessons, um, I, I generally asked people like, what advice would you give? Or if you could go back in time and tell yourself something, what would, what would it be? Uh, and they said things like this. Connecting with the players is the fundamentally most powerful skill you will ever develop. Connecting with the players is the fundamentally most powerful skill you will develop. It's not coding, it's not shaders, it's not 3D modeling, it's connecting with players. Through your design, through your words. Learn to become the sniper rifle instead of the machine gun. Okay, so becoming the sniper rifle instead of the machine gun sounds really weird. What he means is, um, uh, there's an analogy where <clears throat> when you're a beginning designer, you're like a water pistol, like you're shooting all over the place and what you're shooting is not really having much of an effect. Once you learn a thing or two and you're, you're kind of doing a bit better, now you're a machine gun, like you can just smash out bullets and they're, they're having an effect, but maybe you're mowing everything down. What you, and you're just causing a lot of destruction. What you wanna be is you need to get to the place where you're the sniper rifle. You assess the situation and you just go, that thing there, bam, and it fixes a whole bunch of stuff. You didn't have to mow down a whole bunch of code or rebuild an entire system. You were able to pinpoint the problem, the solution, and, and kind of just headshot it, right? He did also say, though, it's important for you to go through the water, the water pistol and the machine gun phase, right? You, need, you, can't, you, know, you can't teleport to, to sniper rifle. But I know it sounds very gun-centric, but I don't know. That, that's his thing. When you're looking at those, though, don't just go and look at like a graph. Actually, ask a question and then try and use the data to answer that question. I think that's okay. So that's Brenton on the data that they collect. You need to be asking questions. You can't just be looking at data and and hoping something will jump out of you. You need to go. Are, are people leaving the game after a week? Or um, you know, uh, 
how many people are choosing this class um, and do they play any other classes or are they only, cho only playing that class, right? You need to be choosing questions. You know, we could have gotten a lot of the community on board first and then those people would have acted as messengers. So the idea there was that uh, with Darkest Dungeon, they were doing a lot of their community management themselves in the beginning. If they had have just been able to get a community manager on right at the beginning, um, they could have A, learnt a lot more about their game and B, actually had people be messengers for them, right? Like I was saying, the community starts managing itself if you're managing it quite well and then your job becomes uh, a little bit less. Know what you're trying to achieve before you get in that fire hose of a, you know, feedback situation. Yeah. Um, so this is about that, that idea of know your core game before you get in, into that feedback thing where you're going to get like blown off course. You need that, like that steady hand on the rudder. You need to know what, what direct, like what is our game and what is it not, right? And balance to that. There's no use breaking our backs and knee jerking and trying to fix a problem where we don't even know. We just know the symptoms. Right. So players can't generally tell you the solutions except for like savants that play Eve. Most of the time, they're going to just give you uh, symptoms and there's no use breaking your back, firefighting all the individual symptoms. Okay. Relax. Take a step back. Let your game be quote unquote unbalanced for a while and see if it either sorts itself out or if you need to attend to it. Rami said he would make lists of problems. That is a bad thing to do. <laughs> I saw some heads like, what? Lists are bad? It's, all it is is once you've got it on a list, now it's infallible. Like, that's the list, right? But that was the list on Tuesday. What he's saying is find to make lists, chuck them out every now and then, and see if when you rebuild them, the same problems are there. Like, don't keep the same problems on the list. Things might have moved on. Rebuild your list every now and then. Chuck something out. If, if there are important issues that are still there, they'll, they'll come. They'll come to the top of the list. And that's it. Thank you.